The landlord, I think every once in a while, should be asked to live in one of the apartments in his own building for a week to get fully dressed like I do and then pull on a comforter and several blankets and try to go to sleep because it's not always possible. I happen to be a businessman. I expect the rent. There was a time when the term housing crisis referred to a housing shortage. Today, the term has taken on a more sinister connotation. Housing crisis means housing decay, housing abandonment. In spite of a desperate need for low-cost, decent housing, entire communities have been devastated. It was in response to this crisis that in 1973, the New York State Legislature established Housing Court. 17C, Riverview against Janet Prince. 17C, Noble Mansions against Bentley and Diane Marshall. 17D. He owes $614.80 through February. Are you on welfare? No, I'm not. You know when you'll be able to get the money? I'm going to apply. I just lost my job. Hey, make sure you go today, because you only have about 12 days. Here, hold it, hold it. Come here. You just, no, you don't take it anywhere. You sign it. You sign it here. Madison, Flores, the Independence. Nothing in my apartment works. The floor is all broken up around the sink. I was bitten by a mouse. There are so many mice, they climb onto everything. I told the landlord to bring an exterminator, but no one wants to do anything. In New York City, all these landlords want their money to be paid, but they don't want to repay them. We're trying to get uh, the landlord to uh, preserve uh, something which is hers and something which we feel is ours, that we pay rent for. We want to live like decent human beings. We, we don't want to smell fumes from a boiler. We don't want the fire department visiting us once a week. Basic necessities and needs, that's all we want. You know, you're talking about a violation of Park Avenue. How can you compare to Park Avenue with us? You should see the building I live in. You know, we don't even get it clean. And they don't give us no heat. We ain't had no heat this whole year. I have to have a cat because the rats are this big. The rats are this big. I don't like his attitude. Because he's Spanish just like I am, you know. I don't like his attitude. It's not, one is not right and two is not fair because I told him I want my, my heat and my hot water. That's the reason why I stopped paying. Sometimes it, uh, you feel that you, you're going to go for a case and you have all the information the tenant owes six, seven, eight months and you have proof of, uh, of delinquencies and yet another 60 days, another 30 days uh, extension for her to come with the rent. Meanwhile, in that 30 days, the tenant skips. Back in 1953, in. one civil court judge could handle the entire non-housing calendar and the housing calendar in the same day, just one judge alone. And then the volume built up and up and up, and uh, now we have uh, upwards of 125,000 cases a, a year. The court mediates evictions, rent strikes, and housing code violations. It has to balance the landlord's need for the rent money with the tenant's right to a habitable apartment. It was believed that by providing a forum for such disputes, the court could stem the tide of abandonment and lead to the preservation of housing in New York City. How is a building supposed to be maintained when the tenant can pay when he feels like it and the landlord has to pay at a certain time? No landlord is in a position to financially subsidize a tenant who does not have the means of paying his rent, interest-free. I came here to show cause because I, I received a 72-hour eviction from my landlord. Have you ever been behind in your rent before? No, I've been there since I was 20 years old. I've been there for seven years. Uh, I have a son and a daughter which uh, got uh, caught pneumonia twice. 
My son just got out of the hospital for asthma. I have a daughter that's seven years old. She has cancer of the bone marrow. She's in Beth Israel Hospital. And I've been running around. I'm five months pregnant myself. The hardships are immediate and real in landlord-tenant court. In contrast, in the criminal court, you're dealing with a past event. The, the, the terrible harm is over, so to speak, and the, the trial is to determine what punishment should be applied. The punishment in landlord-tenant court has yet to come. The tragedy of seeing the meager possessions of a family put out on a street is something that a child probably would remember all their life. In the last 20 years, the dynamics of housing have changed. Banks and insurance companies no longer provide mortgages for rental housing. Owners are unable to get loans to renovate their properties or mortgages to buy new ones. Without this financing, buildings lose their resale value. With no resale value, there is little incentive for maintenance. With no maintenance, the buildings decay. As a result, buildings are bought and sold for short-term profits rather than as long-term investments. We are not leaving. That's 25 years of my life in that building. I'm not going. You just can't move me to no hotel and tell me to leave my furniture there. You can't do that. I'm not going to no hotel. 406 East 184th Street. It's the last occupied building on the block. A tenant, Diamond Davis, has been fighting in court for four years to save the building. Though it only needs $10,000 in repair work to make it habitable, the city has issued a vacate order. The tenants have to leave. The courts has been aware of the situation in this building since 1980. We have took all of the so-called agents, managing agents and owners to court because of heat and hot water violations. And every time the courts seem to ignore our pleas and, and are sided with the landlords or the owners. And when we try to bring the owner who we know now to court, the court just threw the case out and said the tenants, you're on your own. Go for yourself. The building changed hands in 1980. It went to DeGraw Funding Company. From DeGraw Funding Company, it went to Joseph Perry. From Joseph Perry, it went to Sunset Management. From Sunset Management, it went to Zion Laguerre. From Zion Laguerre, it went to New York City Housing and Tenant Association. And from there, it winded up at Jamie Properties. And from there, it went down to a seven mayor administrator, which was Need Housing. And nobody did anything or nothing. We got bills, they took our money, and everybody ran. Housing is increasingly becoming a commodity like soybeans, you know. It's no longer um, being regarded by those people who used to invest in it as shelter plus profit. It's really being used as almost a movable, tangible commodity so that the profit is in buying something low, holding on to it for as short a period of time as possible, either clearing out tenants or, in any case, providing as few costly services as possible, and then flipping it for a profit and getting out. Running a building is a business for a landlord. We have to realize that. Uh, as uh, much as we may not want to, it is strictly a business. A landlord will not put any effort into a building unless he's making a profit. It just seems to be saying, leave. Why don't you take their advice? I've been here for, what, 18 years now. And like I said, I'm like a, you know, I'm not on the log because uh, I'm used to the people, I'm used to the surroundings, you know. I'm used to the area. And I can't afford the rents. I really can't. This is a rent control building. I can't afford three, four hundred dollars a month rent. I make a pretty decent salary, but I still cannot afford it. If you buy a building, you're responsible to see that the people in that building uh, have a place to live which is safe and habitable. Housing can't be just treated as normal businesses, and it's not.
we don't accept that an owner can make the decision that I don't have the money, therefore I'm not going to do this repair or I'm not going to deliver fuel. People can go cold for three days because I don't have the money to do that. That's an acceptable business decision. It's not an acceptable housing decision. We got people who are living in hotels who, will, who are willing to come back under these conditions and pool that $300 a week that, you know, they are giving them to live in two rooms in one of the flimsy hotels downtown. We run the lights in the hallway. It's the tenant association who keep putting locks on that front door every time they kick them off. And who buys the padlock to, to keep them apartments locked up instead of being vandalized and pipe pulling. If you don't want to do anything, then give us the opportunity and the authority to rent out apartments to people who are willing to take, uh, take chances and sacrifice until we get the necessary funds in order to repair this building. We do not want to leave the building. We've been here too long. We have people in the building been here for 25 years, have raised families, have raised children and grandchildren in the building. It's very hard to make them move, to uproot them. Now these people are willing to sacrifice, but no one wants to help us. I think the court can only go so far. When you're talking about actual improvements, you're talking about the expenditure of money. Uh, a court can't order an owner to spend money he doesn't have. A court can't order the city to spend money it doesn't have. Uh, a court doesn't run programs and select buildings for rehabilitation. So I, I think that the court can't really relate to those kinds of problems. What the housing court can do is to keep landlords, private and public, bound to their legal responsibilities to provide services to tenants. Uh, that's a critical holding action. It means that in marginal housing and in marginal neighborhoods, if the court does the job it should do, tenants won't be forced to flee housing that may eventually be able to have rehabilitation money put into it and be brought higher up in standard. It may keep things in a, in a holding pattern, really. Well, I think that the court has done an awful lot uh, to protect the housing that uh, has not deteriorated yet and to compel owners in the deteriorated areas to uh, upgrade the housing stock or, um, or leave it entirely. The tenant now has the right to start a tenant-initiated action to enforce their rights under the code, the enforcement code. So there are all kinds of outlets available to tenants today that there weren't years ago. Carmen Gonzalez lives on Wheeler Avenue in the South Bronx. She's gone without heat and gas for over a year. She can't plug in an electric heater because the apartment is only one working outlet. When Carmen withheld her rent, the landlord initiated eviction proceedings. Well, for a long time, I was complaining that I smelled gas. I went to Con Edison several times, and they said it was the landlord's problem. So I explained it to the landlord, and he continued with the same game of saying that it was Con Edison's problem. So that's why I had to take action, and I stopped paying my rent. The landlord refused to repair, so he said he would not give any service. It's been a couple of months that she's been without no gas, and this is daily per day that she has to be paying when to eat outside. You know, the cost of living is a high cost of living nowadays. And she's only on public assistance. She don't have no other income coming in. When she has to cook, she has to use this stove. And there's only one extension because there's three rooms in the apartment without no light. Okay, she has the rent here with her. You have $500 here in rent, honey. You want some service to be done because, you know, with the snowstorm, you know, it's dangerous. With all that snow, no gas or anything, you know, we had to have heaters on. You know, there was no heat. The apartment, the water, pressure of the water is no good up to the fifth floor. is no good at all. So that's the reason why we're here. We want to see some services be done, you know. There's five children involved. I have 
not seen anybody who comes in here who is living in a luxury apartment or living under good conditions and is withholding their rent in order to abuse the system. Most of the, uh, the tenants here have the rent is either set aside or they're going to get it from the Department of Social Services. They've turned their rent checks back or stopped them. The rent money is going to come. They're not trying to rip anybody off, but they want repairs. The repairs that the tenant states are often not known to the landlord until the day they come to court. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the, the time, maybe, I guess, to go into the apartments and go and inspect the, the, you know, the condition of the property. You, see, you give them the apartment when they first move in, and that's it. And then the next time you see them, it's, it's, it's in court. When you look at the conditions of housing in the Bronx, and you can see that people are living in substandard conditions. And it's the ones that are here, the ones that have come to stand up and fight for it. Now, whether their fight has gotten them anywhere is another question. Carmen Gonzalez went into the courthouse, and uh, Mr. Peter Anderson, Alexander, did not appear in court. The judge gave us an extension and told us that we have to come back to see if within a week's time he does any repairing. And they gave us an emergency number, HDA, that's a car Edison, emergency number to put her gas on, so she doesn't have any gas in the house. And uh, to see if he could do any, re not to give any money into the courthouse until he does any repairing. So we have to come back for another extension, you know, another date in court. Where was the landlord? He did not appear. He didn't come into court. And what about your landlord's attorney? Nobody appeared at all. The problem is there is just no enforcement. If a landlord is ordered to do something and he doesn't do it, how many times has a landlord been held in contempt of court? How many times has a landlord been fined or put into uh, jail for enforcement? It's just not there, and they know it. The tenant knows that he's going to be evicted if he doesn't pay that rent. So they usually end up collecting the money or the marshal come and putting them out. But as far as improving standards, I would say it's the exception rather than the rule. Certainly there are disreputable landlords that don't provide maintenance and there are legitimate grievances of tenants. I think probably the biggest grievance of both landlords and tenants, which should be redressed in any of these actions, is to get the courts to move more swiftly and to hear cases instead of granting adjournment after adjournment after adjournment. I'm typically here today on an order to show cause by a tenant who has not paid rent now since November. I have been carrying this tenant for four months through winter heating season, paying for fuel bills, maintenance in the building. The building is in good shape, no violations of substance, and yet the tenant has not paid the rent. I always like to talk about delay because delay doesn't always mean something bad. If a tenant comes into court and tells the court that there are repairs that have to be made, and then one, one of these 755 orders are entered. That means that from that month on, the tenant pays the rent into court, and the landlord uh, is supposed to be making the repairs. So therefore, no matter how many months go by, uh, really delay is something that tenant doesn't mind and landlord doesn't mind because there's a meeting of the minds, and each are proceeding seemingly uh, in, in goodwill. However, uh, that can be cut by one of them not doing what they're supposed to do. For court to be effective, people have to respect it. And it's very hard to respect the court where the judges sit in closets. A lot of people are crowded into an area. There's virtually no waiting rooms uh, for three or four of the courtrooms, which are not off the main waiting room. Uh, very unacceptable situation. New space has to be allocated. Judges should have access to typing pools. I mean, we shouldn't have to see long decisions handwritten, and judges should have help in doing legal research because if they're making law, which is important to people, they should have all the facilities and all the support necessary to make correct law. Yeah, I'm very proud uh, of the operation of the court. The only problem I have is, is uh, the volume that we have is such that we need more judges and we need more clerks, we need more court officers. And above all, in the Bronx, we need more space. The problems the court faces are more than problems of space alone. There's a problem of poverty. There's a problem of welfare. There's a problem of socioeconomic conditions here in the Bronx, more so than there were years ago. In a normal housing market, where an owner has a long-term interest in his building, the court can have a great effect. But when buildings become commodities, when mortgages are sold for 10 cents on the dollar, the court's rulings are easily ignored. 98% of the fines issued by the court are never collected. Where the court can be effective, 
is in buildings that are just starting to decay. One such building is 2701 Grand Concourse. The building changed hands twice in two years. Repairs were left undone, and there were long periods without heat and hot water. In 1983, the tenants took the owner to court. The right amount? No. no. We went in before a judge, and the judge had us sit down and said he would try and work something out. It was a good house. He didn't want to lose the house because that starts the neighborhood to go. Let's try and keep the neighborhood. He wanted to save the building. It was a good building, basically. But the writing was on the wall. It was turning into a slum. So we worked out an agreement. A certain number of people on the committee with the landlord would sign all checks. The rents would be turned into the court. All the bills would be paid in conjunction with the tenants and the landlord, which was working out fine. Only what happened? We were more interested in getting the repairs done in the building than pay the mortgagees. You tell we, it, mister. Now we're back in court again before Judge Haber, who don't want to know nothing about the other agreement between the, the landlord and the tenant and the money's in a bank account. We're all getting dispossessed notices that we didn't pay back until last September. Haber ignored Judge Trussell's orders. We would have found ourselves losing in trials yes. and paying rent twice. So it's a good example how when there's a plan to save a building made by one judge, it's totally ignored by another judge. We weren't even able to tell the story of how this building came to the point of being in a joint partnership with the landlord. We were just told to pay our rent and stop this unnatural relationship between tenant and landlord. He didn't think he, we could run a building, so why don't we just release the money and give it back to the, you know, the landlord so he can you know, do the services. And you know it was being run beautifully. <laughs> it never was so well run as when the right. tenants did it. Frida is a bookkeeper. She kept the accounts <coughs> perfect, every to the last penny. Don was just excellent and his everything, you know, meticulous. We'd, we'd just bent over backwards so that everything would be paid up and there wouldn't be any reason to complain. And we were getting the repairs all done. After all, he said, you're not children anymore. <laughs> this is 1983. Why don't you sit down and look at it this way? What do you need? Remember this? Yes. What do you need this for? The tenants are the ones that can save a building, not the court. The judge can do just so much even a judge that's willing to work with the tenants. So the tenants themselves have to be organized and basically put enough pressure on the judge by being there in great numbers, by knowing what the law is and what the potential for protection is, and then when the case comes before the judge, making sure that he does in fact enforce the law. But too often, the tenants are not organized enough, and too often the judge will take advantage of that by going along with the landlord. Why is it the courts protect the landlords to see that their rents are paid and dispossesses and everything else, but when the tenants want heat and hot water and the other things that they're entitled to, it's completely disregarded. Clearly an owner should not be allowed to take out any profit or what have you when, when there was not sufficient additional money to, um, to maintain the property, and I think that's true of mortgage payments as well that the mortgagee has to come second to the tenant's welfare. When I went down to the court once, and I was complaining about something once, and I went down there and I was surrounded by black women with their children, and their noses were running, they were all sick, the mothers were sick, and she told me that she stood in the kitchen up to her knees in water practically, coming from upstairs. I mean, you can't tell me that this is right or that it ever should go on in a country like this. The potential cost to upgrade all housing in New York City is staggering. There are two million rental units. Many buildings need literally thousands of dollars worth of uh, repairs and upgrading. When you're dealing with two million apartments, if the average citywide, and this is just a made-up number, is a thousand dollars, you're talking about two billion dollars. So obviously that money is not available. So in terms of the city itself, when it makes policy, it has to take into account what monies are available to do it. That's why I think one of the most critical aspects for everybody is to involve private financing. There has to be a recognition of the historical reality that the private market has never provided affordable, decent, low-cost housing in this country. That programs for 
low-cost housing have always been either heavily government subsidized or totally public programs. And until and unless the reality of that situation is recognized, I am afraid that uh, there will be a disappearance of housing for poor and working people in this city and in this country. I don't believe that the court has done much in preserving housing, but I can't blame it on the court. If there is a problem with the housing stock, it's my opinion, and I believe the, the opinion of my colleagues, that the legislature has to take a lot of the responsibility for the decline of the housing stock in the Bronx and in New York. The tenants of 2701 Grand Concourse, under threat of eviction from the court, gave up the rent strike. They continue to press for repairs without the court's assistance, but once again, the building is up for sale. And this is the crux of the whole thing. They all know each other. They dine together. Where is justice when you walk in there? You're dead. You're dead. Have you looked for another apartment? I've been filling out applications for the last three years. I've applied for an apartment at Setco, Siska, and the Housing Authority. They all tell me I have to wait like anyone else, that it's all a question of luck. Carmen met with mixed results in the court. The landlord repaired her stove, and she received a two-month rent abatement. But the court did not deal with any of the other problems. There has been no heat and hot water in her building for over a year and a half. I'm not begging for nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for what is right, what, 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 what my right is. They want that Fordham Road section, but they, they are not going to get that building unless they burn it down over me. This building is now abandoned. The tenants have scattered. Diamond Davis, whereabouts unknown. your building and it's marked either ready or inquest if you have those computer printout sheets go right up to room 809 that's on the eighth floor I'm gonna make this announcement in Spanish for our Spanish speaking audience eres el inquilino cuando llame su nombre contesta inquilino si eres el casero contesta casero what you got to show to the judge, I'll That's prove what I got to prove to the judge, right. but I'm not going to agree under the circumstances to do this time. Riverview against Janice Prince, 17C, Global Mansions against Bentley and Diane Marshall. Where is uh, Norbert and Adelstein and the other attorney? Where are they? On that Panzani against Friedman and Marcus. Marilyn, right here. 